I'm excited. Why? Because we're talking about Carl Jung today. I love the guy. He suggested that we're all the same deep down. Doesn't matter your religion, your race, your gender. <laughs> Don't matter. We're all the same. He studied fairy tales. So if you study Carl Jung, you're studying fairy tales. His sex life? Yeah, we're going to talk about that too. And of course, we're gonna talk about his theory. So many things, I'm excited, I'm nervous, because I love psychology. Your mother. We're gonna cover three main things about Carl Jung today. We're gonna to talk about his past, as we do with all of these theorists in the psychology of personality. You will be able to see how the history of these theorists influences their theory, and Carl Jung, he's no exception. We're gonna talk about his theory, of course, and then we're gonna talk about his assessment techniques, number three. Let's jump on in. Go, go. The history of Carl Jung. He was born in Switzerland in 1875. He was born into a very religious family. They had a whole bunch of family members that were part of the clergy, uncles, relatives, etc. Very religious. His parents were in a failing marriage. His dad was considered weak and irritable. He didn't really have any authority over anyone, so no one really listened to him, maybe because he was complaining so much. And his mother, was considered highly emotionally unstable. People didn't even want their kids playing with little boy Carl Jung because of his mother. His mother was being described as very fat and unattractive. Now I'm not trying to fat shame her, I'm using Carl Jung's own description of his mother. Fat and unattractive. Why? Why even talk about it then, Professor Gerding? Good question. Let me tell you why. This is absolutely going to play into his theory and his relationship with Sigmund Freud. You probably know what Sigmund Freud said about his mother. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Anywho, fat ugly mom, weak dad, other parents told their kids, don't play with Carl, because he's from that crazy family with that crazy, fat, unattractive mom. So he was a loner. He avoided other children. In fact, he has this quote, the pattern of my relationship to the world was already prefigured. Today as then, I am solitary. I think I nailed that. He spent time with himself and he dove into his dreams. Big dreamer. In fact, he very specifically talked about this very vivid dream he had of being an archeologist, digging in the deep. Why is that important? Because we're gonna learn in his theory, he was all about inner growth and self-examination and digging deep into the unconscious. More on that later. Calm down, calm down. We'll get there. So exciting! His best friend, <laughs> good luck, was a wooden doll that he made for himself. Do you see anything to the west, little wooden boy? You know, the problem with school is if you're a loner, there's other kids there. You can't really be alone in school. And so Carl Jung was a schoolboy fainter. He would just be in the middle of class and, oh, oh. Hey, I've got a question to you. He would continually have to be picked up from school, taken home, excused. And eventually he overheard his father say, and this is important, especially if you're a student in my class because it will be on the test. His father, he overheard say, what will become of the boy if he cannot earn his living? Because he's not learning anything, he's constantly fainting. So when Carl Jung heard this, that's when he kind of made the switcheroo and started doing academically better. He did well enough to study psychiatry at the University of Basel. So he made it to uni, college, and there his interests were in dreams, the occult, the supernatural, superstitions. If he was alive today, I imagine Carl Jung would be all about those supernatural ghost catching shows. He'd probably love horror movies, Marvel comics, heck yeah! He'd be a big fan of comic books. And he did all right for himself because he ended up marrying the second richest heiress in all of Switzerland. Second wealthiest family in all of Switzerland is what he got married into. That's a big deal. I'm not sure how much you know about Switzerland, but they got some money. 
it's not like we're talking about the second richest heiress in Kazakhstan. No offense to Kazakhstan. No, Switzerland is where the banks are, besides the cheese and those little knives. Pretty money there. So anyway, he's wealthy now. He spent a lot of his time driving around town in his fancy sports car. Oh, let's see what the poor people are doing today. Just married the second richest heiress in all of Switzerland. <laughs> But since he was studying psychiatry, he was interested in the most famous name in psychology of that time, and arguably still the most famous name in psychology, Sigmund Freud. So he decided he was gonna meet Sigmund Freud. So they met. Have you ever met someone and you instantly kind of just clicked? You realize, this is my person. We're so similar. If you were a chick, who's the one guy you would sleep with? John Samos. What? Did we just become best friends? Yup! Do you want to go do karate in the garage? Yup! And you start talking to that individual and time seems to have melted away. Oh my goodness, what time is it? I can't believe we've been talking this long. I'm not sure if you've ever had that experience. Sigmund Freud, Carl Jung, they did have that experience. How long did that experience last? 13 hours. Their first conversation lasted 13 hours, nonstop. Eventually, the wives, who were also at this meeting, kind of knocked in the door. Uh, hey, uh, Carl? I'm really rich and you married me. Can we go home now? Cause it's, uh, you've been talking for about 13 hours. Hmm. Their relationship, Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud was pretty intense. So even though there was a 20 year difference between these individuals, they spent six years together, constantly staying in touch with one another. They talked to each other extensively. They wrote letters to each other. In fact, that's how we know this is because we get to read their letters, like prying into some teenage girl's diary. <laughs> Were you trying to read my diary? What? We get to read Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud's correspondences. And there's some interesting stuff in there. For instance, Sigmund Freud wrote a letter to Carl Jung saying, I formally adopt you as an eldest son and anoint you as my successor and the crown prince. He's basically saying, I'm really famous. And when I go, I want you to whoop, have the crown. Now come the days of the king. You are the next Sigmund Freud. When people see you, they'll be like, hey, they're singing too. Carl Jung, he wrote back, let me enjoy your friendship, not as one between equals, but as that of father and son. Basically saying, I think of you as a father figure. But oh, slow, slow down. Why is this so interesting? Besides the fact these two are going through a hardcore bromance, it's not even brotherly, it's like father and son. What did Sigmund Freud say about sons and fathers? It seems very important that Freud, when you think of the Oedipus complex, says, well, boys wanna murder their fathers and sleep with their mothers. So when Freud says like, oh, you're my son, and he's like, you're my dad, doesn't that in Freud's world mean there's murderous intent? Yes, Carl Jung broke it off with Sigmund Freud, basically dumped him. Well, I don't think that we should be together. And I've thought about it a lot, and this is what's gonna happen. Okay, I'm gonna keep pursuing what I'm pursuing. And because I'm doing that, it's gonna take up more and more of my time, and I'm not gonna be able to spend as much time with you. And Freud was devastated. Some people even say that on Freud's deathbed, he still bemoaned the loss of his relationship with Carl Jung. Why did they break up? It has to do with their theories. Sigmund Freud really talked about the libido being sexual. The source of all conflict comes from sex, 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 sex. Sex, 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 sex. Sigmund Freud talked a lot about sex. Carl Jung said, hey, slow down with the sex, man. Let's, uh, let's bring it back a little bit. I'm not sure it has everything to do with sex. Six years, constantly staying in touch with each other. Separated, severed, ouch, breakup. Welcome to Dumpsville. Population you, Sigmund Freud. So we should talk about Carl Jung's sex life a little bit. It was 
prolific. Carl Jung advised, you shouldn't necessarily hide affairs from your spouse. Oh, you should have affairs, but you should just be open with it. In fact, Carl Jung, he lived not only with his wealthy wife, but he also lived with his mistress. So when you came over, he'd be like, hello, I'm Carl Jung, and this is my wife. And this is my lover. He would only notoriously take on attractive female students and he would openly tell them day one. Just so you know, by the time we're done here, we will have had sex. And supposedly he was pretty much right. They would have sexual relationships. They even have a movie pretty much about Carl Jung and some of his sexy sex life. It's a dangerous method. <laughs> Sex. Male. Family. Child. Divorce. No. Professor Freud. Dr. Jung. I've simply opened a door. It's for the young men like yourself to walk through it. Perhaps she's the one for your experimental treatment. Tell me about the first time you can remember being beaten by your father. It excited me! How is your little Russian patient? There was the most dramatic improvement. Is she a virgin? Oh, certainly. If you ever want to take the initiative, I live in that building there. Why should we put so much effort into suppressing our most basic natural instincts? Never repress anything. I want you to punish me. There's a rumor running around Vienna that you've taken one of your patients as a mistress. I recommend it. It's interesting. If you're watching this video, you're going to spend enough time learning stuff. You might as well be entertained. Anyway, so Jung went on and he didn't want to live in the shadow of Sigmund Freud anymore because if I were to tell you like, hey, you're going to be the next Professor Gerding. When people see you, they're going to think of me. You may start to desire, you know, I kind of want to have my own identity. Thank you very much. Get away from me, Mr. Creepy. And that's kind of what Carl Jung did. But at age 38, he had a neurotic episode as it was titled at the time, neurotic. Nowadays, we use the term anxiety. So he struggled with anxiety, maybe even some depressive issues. Why, what, what, what makes you say that, Professor Gritty? Why did he do that? Well, even though he kept his practice going on, he spent every night with a loaded revolver next to his nightstand, just in case, quote, he felt he had passed beyond the point of return. <sighs> That's some pretty messed up stuff. Just in case I wake up in the middle of the night. <sighs> yep, it's time. <laughs> so yeah, he struggled with issues. How did he get through it? Well, he was his own patient, his own client, and he confronted his issues through his dreams. And he kept a dream journal. I don't know if you keep a dream journal at home. I recommend it. It gets pretty wild. And if you write in your journal enough, you get better and better at it. Through this, he came up with this theory. And after he kept this dream journal during his neurotic episode, he had an entire book full of dreams and his interpretations of those dreams. That book is known as The Red Book. Ooh, I have it right here. The Red Book by Carl Jung. And this is the reader's edition, it's been edited. He kept it under lock and key, actually, it's only relatively recently that the public has been able to purchase all of Carl Jung's dreams, journalings, liber novice. Good stuff, pretty entertaining, can be confusing, which is why I got the cheat sheet book. <laughs> it's like the Cliff Notes version of. So what about the rest of Carl Jung's life? Well, he found a lot of success both professionally and personally. And I'm not just talking about his sex life. People did say that he had a lot of bizarre behaviors. And I'm not just talking about his sex life. He would often greet kitchen utensils and other things in his home. Hello, gavel. Hi, tape measure. How you doing? Whoa. He was reportedly worried about money all the time. Even though we already covered this, really wealthy, second richest heiress in all of Switzerland wife. He would hide money in all sorts of places among his home and he'd forget where he hid it. I'm hiding so much money right here in the gentle art of tramping. Damn it! Strategically, I kept money in my 
envelopes that were unused so I could find where the... Damn it! Most of that money he hid in books is long gone, although the money he buried in his yard is probably still there. Found anything yet? Not a thing, sir! What about you guys? We ain't found shit! Young attracted a whole bunch of followers throughout his entire life. He kept up with his research and publications. He had wealthy investors that invested in his books and he even finagled translation. So it was not just in German, it was in a whole bunch of different languages, which just helped with his fame and his fortune as he went on. Eventually he died in 1961 at age 85, 86, 86. I think. It doesn't matter. He's dead anyways. But he died of heart problems, circulatory issues. But now that we talked about his past, we should talk about his theory. Let's get into the good stuff. Here's what he came up with. He said, you know what? I disagree with Freud on so many ideas. The crucial time in someone's life isn't in their childhood before the age of five. No. He said the most important time in someone's life is right now. He was saying that about himself, meaning he was in midlife, therefore the most important time in someone's life is midlife. Why? Why, Carl Jung? Well, according to Carl Jung, society tells you exactly what you're supposed to be doing throughout your life. They give you an instruction manual. Oh, you're a kid. You need to be obedient. You need to learn how to crap in the toilet. You need to go to school behave. Then once you start going to school, they say, all right, now that you're finishing grade school, time to go to college. While you're in college or after college, you should probably get some work. Once you find work or somewhere in that midst, you need to find someone that you love. Once you find someone to love, what are you supposed to do? Make babies. And then once you start making yourself a family, then you're supposed to raise these children, give them the same steps that you followed until they fly free out of the nest and away they go woo and you know what you're supposed to do once your children are old enough that they leave the house i'm asking because that's what carl young was asking and that's what he said caused his neurotic episode all right you were giving me all these instructions now what am i supposed to do i don't know what are we supposed to do? we don't know you're kind of on your own so the most interesting crucial time in someone's life is when society no longer is telling you what to do you've done it all so now what are you you're just supposed to keep working and die? Is, is that basically what people are saying you're supposed to do? Carl Jung realized this is the cause of so many crises and it's only then that you learn who you are. This is gonna be a term called individuation. Whoa, did I do that right? Am I looking the right way? Carl Jung called this transformational crucial time in your life in middle age individuation. That is the process of you finding your true self. He was very specific in how you should successfully achieve proper individuation. You're no longer being told by society what's up, what's right, what's wrong, and you should embrace that. You should look inwards and find your true self. He said you should abandon the behaviors and values that guided you. They should dethrone this persona, basically. These masks that you wear, like I'm a son, I'm a father, I'm an employee, etc. Get rid of that. Be the real you. Who are you? Who am I? Well, how do you figure that out? Listen to your dreams. Listen to your fantasies. Acknowledge that you have this shadow within you. These dark impulses that seem maybe what people would say wrong or evil or perverted. Stop feeling shame about it and acknowledge that they exist. Don't pretend you don't have those impulses when you do. Express yourself through creative means. You know, explore, have some fun. Are you getting into Tai Chi? You into paint? You into poetry? Dive in. There's a whole world out there of interest that maybe you've never tried and maybe you were embarrassed to try, but you should go for it. And this kind of leaks into what else he suggested. And he also suggested to really embrace our bisexuality. Carl Jung, progressively, he argued, we are naturally bisexual. That when we come out of the womb, we look around, we see men, women, doesn't matter. There's a whole bunch of sexiness going on around in the world. 
But society says, oh, boys, you're supposed to be attracted to girls. Girls, you're supposed to be attracted to boys. And this is really emphasized throughout. Now, this doesn't mean that Carl Jung said you should just embrace bisexuality and start doing the people you haven't done before. No, he should just say you shouldn't outright deny that there may be impulses. For instance, do you have a problem acknowledging someone looks attractive? If you're a man and you see a male actor like Brad Pitt, Hugh Jackman, Jude Law, I'm a Jude Law fan myself. That doesn't necessarily mean I wanna go out and do him, but at the same time, if I looked like Brad Pitt, I probably wouldn't be complaining. Realize it's not as cut and dry as heterosexual and homosexual. That's what Carl Jung was suggesting. And last but not least, don't let the unconscious dominate. Try to figure out your unconscious as much as possible. That's all of Sigmund Freud's racket. The whole theory of Sigmund Freud is you shouldn't let your unconscious remain unconscious. You should dig down deep, bring it to light, and accept it. That doesn't mean indulge in it and let it conquer. It means acknowledge it and use it. Don't let it use you. Don't let it use you. You use it. But he didn't just disagree with Freud about when our most crucial time of development is. <laughs> no, Carl Jung criticized this idea of the libido being sexual energy. He agreed that there is this energy and he even called it libido, but it wasn't just about being randy and horny and I want sex. No, he changed it. He said it's a more general psychic energy. It's always interesting too because Carl Jung, he steps away from Sigmund Freud because Sigmund Freud was too obsessed with sex. And Sigmund Freud had a horrible sex life. He even gave it up at age 30, 40. I don't remember. I, I should know this stuff. But he gave it up. I think it was 40. Carl Jung, he says, you talk about sex too much, Sigmund Freud, but I'm having it. So where does this energy come from? That comes from the three principles of psychic energy. I can explain those in better detail right now. Let's talk about Carl Jung's three principles of psychic energy. And for this, I have props. I'm gonna put on my specs. Now we're ready to do this. See this red liquid? This red liquid I'm gonna use to represent your psychic energy, as Carl Jung calls it. What do you do with your energy? I'm asking you. You can put it in the comments, but what do you like to do with your psychic energy? Do you like to play video games? Do you like horseback riding? Do you like, I don't know, hang gliding? This is your psychic energy. There's the principle of equivalence, there's the principle of opposites, and there's the principle of entropy. So let's first talk about his principle of equivalence. You only have so much psychic energy at one time, so you have to strategically choose to what you're placing in your psychic energy. To explain this more, I have these cups back here. For instance, let's suppose that here you have kind of opposing cups. This is your work. Oh my goodness, I have a job. I gotta do a lot of things, GPS report covers, and I have assignments and a test that you have to study for. Right. Whatever you consider work, that's what this is. And work's important. So you know what you're going to do? You're going to go ahead and you're going to pour some of this psychic energy into your work. Mm, it's worth my time to how much do I put in? Well, work's really important. So I'm going to put in a lot because I want to get it done. Oh, yeah. Don't drip any. Psychic energy is delicious. So here's your work. So what's this cup going to represent then? Well, this will be kind of the opposite. This is play. Play video games, hanging out with your friends, maybe reading. I don't know what you do for fun, but it's in this cup. So good thing we have enough energy. We can put some into play. Yay. Right? Oh my goodness. But you know what? There's not a lot of energy left over for play. And that's the principle of equivalence. It's the idea that we don't have unlimited amounts of psychic energy. We kind of wish we did so we could do everything, but we have to be strategic in what we choose. But wouldn't it be nice if we had more psychic energy so we could pour more into play? Well, that's where the principle of opposites comes in. According to the principles of opposites, this frustration of opposing activities actually creates more psychic energy. 
Frustration is aggravating. And suddenly, doo -doo -doo, we have more psychic energy that starts occurring. Do I work? Do I play? I want to do them both, but I can't do them both. Ooh, Super Saiyan! Yeah! And now you have more psychic energy. Delicious. Now I can put more energy into my play. You've heard the expression, work hard, play hard? Well, perhaps Carl Jung would agree when it comes to his principle of opposites with psychic energy. Those two opposing forces create more energy. The opposites create psychic energy. Principle of equivalence, we only have so much psychic energy. But then we have the principle of entropy. Entropy, generically and probably incorrectly explained, is this idea energy wants to evenly disperse. So if you have a really hot metal bar and you have a really cold metal bar and you touch them, instead of having a really cold metal bar and hot metal bar, now you have two warm bars because that temperature disperses between the two of them. Entropy. Well, that's the concept of principle of entropy with psychic energy because ideally we want to put the same amount of energy into everything we possibly can. So maybe this over here, it doesn't even have to be activities. It could be emotions. Let's suppose this is anger and this is happiness. Oh, I hate things. Oh, this makes me mad. Oh, goodwill to all people and harmony. These happen at the same time because realistically, let's suppose you're working, but you're really angry at work. So you're working angrily. But anger actually takes energy as well. So now you don't have all this energy for just work. You're going to share it with anger. Now you're less efficient at work because you're spending energy with anger. Oh, and same thing can be said with play and anger. You can angrily play or maybe love and play. Ooh. And now you have less energy for everything involved. And that kind of goes back to the principle of equivalence. But the principle of entropy is the desire to evenly distribute all of our energy evenly between all things. We wish we could do it all equally and beneficially. I wish I was a great employee and worker. I wish I was a really good video game player. I wish I was really good with my anger but also really good with my love. I want to be this dominating force of wrath while also being loving and compassionate. We want to be good at all things equally, but we never can. We never can for a couple of things. One, the principle of equivalence. We don't have enough energy to do everything. But here's the more interesting aspect. The principles of opposites, right? We compete where we should pour our energy and that creates more energy with the tension. If we had everything evenly distributed, there would be no tension. There would be no competition. Everything is being fed. So without that tension, what would happen to our energy levels? They would just vanish and we would have an empty vassal of psychic energy. Hopefully that makes sense. Let me review really quickly the principle of equivalence is that you only have so much energy at some time. Principle of opposites, energy is created by opposing forces. Principle of entropy, we want to be as evenly distributed as possible, but we can't be because that defeats the previous two principles. Whew! Not sure if that makes sense. Let's get back to the other concepts of Carl Jung. He talked a lot about personality. In fact, his word for personality is psyche. And as you study different personality theorists throughout the age, yes, most of them are all white Eurocentric dudes. And each one tends to have their own little vocabulary set and their own word they use for personality. Carl Jung's word for personality, psyche. So if you were a student and you were taking my next test, and I asked you, hey, what's Carl Jung's word for personality? Then your answer is psyche. Yeah. So let's talk about the systems of your psyche. He basically took Sigmund Freud's theory, copied, pasted, and then made changes. 
For instance, he still believes in the levels of consciousness. And your ego is basically your consciousness. They're one and the same. So what you're constantly thinking about right now, what you're saying to yourself in your head, that's your ego. But here's two big vocabulary terms that Jung contributed. You've probably heard of these, and maybe you never knew hey, who, who, uh, who really came up and popularized these terms. And these terms I'm talking about are what Carl Jung called the two attitudes, and they are introversion versus extroversion. What? Introversion versus extroversion. There's so many different ways to describe introversion versus extroversion. Commonly today, people just abuse the terms and they say, oh, you're shy, you're introverted. Oh, you're outgoing, you're extroverted. And Carl Jung, the man who came up with these terms, he said, that's too simple. You can't just say shy versus outgoing because if it was shy versus outgoing, we would just say shy versus outgoing. So you shouldn't just be using it willy nilly. It's basically, where do you channel your energy? <laughs> Later on, people would describe it as, where do you recharge your batteries? For instance, when you're really tired and you've just done something that may be stressful or exhausting, what do you do? Do you say, man, I really got to go hang out with my friends. I got to go to Todd's house, see how Todd's doing. Darnell will be there. Todd, Darnell, and myself, we're all going to hang out. Or do you say, man, I just need a nice warm bath, some alone time, some good old fashioned me time. Me, 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 me. But the reality is, it's not just cut and dry. You don't just have a pile of introverts and a pile of extroverts. There's a lot of changing going on. One day you may be an introvert, another day you'll be an extrovert. Carl Jung himself acknowledged this. There's a continuum as what he's saying and what I'm telling you and what you should know about introversion versus extroversion. Depends on situations, depends on the day, what's going on in your life. Long story short, we are all introverts and extroverts, but we do have a habit of being more of one than the other. It is very possible that you can be a very outgoing person, but actually be introverted because you're really good at performing. Hey, look at me, I'm performing in front of you. Pay attention to me, everybody. Hi, how are you? But inside you're thinking, I can't wait to get out of here and go home and relax. I'm so exhausted, so much more. So now we get into something of personality typology and a lot of the theorists that we cover in the psychology of personality, they have a personality typology. In Sigmund Freud, for instance, his typology can be simplified into fixations in the psychosexual stages. For instance, if you were anal expulsive versus anal retentive, both of those were fixated in the anal stage, but they're very different. Where are you getting the pleasure from your anus, etc.? What a good boy. We're not talking about Sigmund Freud. Now we're talking about the typology for <laughs> Carl Jung. I'm using my laptop right here because I don't want to mess this up. He said you have four different categories of individuals, but each of those categories fall under the umbrella of introversion and extroversion. So if I put it up here, you're going to see, oh, extroverted and introverted. And what are these four different approaches? Well, there's thinking, feeling, sensing, and intuiting. Intuiting, intuiting. So what are these terms and what do they mean? Well, if you're a thinker, it implies that you like a lot of mental masturbation. You like to really use your mind and that's where you're getting a lot of your energy from. During any part of the day, you feel like you need to be working out your mind more than perhaps your muscles or anything else. I will now transport Sir Isaac Newton into the modern day. Reporting power failure. Oh, oh, oh sweet Clayton. Feeling is more about emotions. You get your energy and your satisfaction for making sure emotions are comfortable and cozy and where you need them to be. If you're one of those individuals that would actually pay money to avoid awkward emotional situations, or if someone in the room isn't comfortable, then you're not comfortable, you're kind of in the feeling camp. Feelings. Nothing more than feeling. Sensing is all about your five senses, smell, touch, taste, sound. Mm -mm. And if you really like your senses, then you're going to embrace them. And that's where you get a lot of your energy is that you need that 
sensational sensation sensing food smells whatever that top note that cream pure vanilla sweeteners mm, that's a 10. and then intuiting is about your gut your intuition that's where the truth lies right down here in the gut do you know you have more nerve endings in your gut than you have in your head you can look it up now I know some of you are gonna say I did look it up and that's not true <laughs> that's because you looked it up in a book next time look it up in your gut I did my gut tells me that's how our nervous system works so with intuiting you really rely on hunches and your own predictions and you probably can't even verbalize why you're feeling or doing the things you're doing just because this feels right but each of those typologies are different based on whether you are introverted or extroverted i'll give you some examples so for instance extroverted sensing someone who is that sensation seeker you're extreme let's go snowboarding off a mountain into a ocean full of sharks yeah <laughs> But what if you're an introverted sensation seeker? What are you then? Maybe these are musicians, people who really enjoy music and things that you can do alone without seeing a whole bunch of other people. Drinking some fine wine, tasting a very delectable meal while listening to your favorite music. Ah, so nice, these senses. So let's talk about uh, thinkers, right? So extroverted thinkers, you're looking at scientists, these individuals that get paid to basically go to a lab, do lab work, and publish, debate with other scientists. No, I think this, no, I think this. Well, my hypothesis is But if you're an introverted thinker, the ascetic hermits, very prolific with the writings, think of philosophers. Control yourself. <laughs> the white eternal light is penetrating your temple, going down through your body. So we already said that Carl Jung agrees with Sigmund Freud and the different levels of the consciousness, but specifically where Sigmund Freud called it the pre-conscious, Carl Jung called it the personal unconscious. W what is this? What is Sigmund Freud's pre-conscious and what is Carl Jung's personal unconscious. These are things you once thought of and you can think of again if you consciously will it. It's just a fancy way of thinking of long-term memory. I thought something in the past, I can think about it again by bringing up my personal unconscious, the pre-conscious. But Carl Jung did add an entirely new level of consciousness when compared to Sigmund Freud. Because Sigmund Freud had consciousness, pre-conscious, personal unconscious, and the unconscious, but then even deeper than that, is the collective unconscious. And this is a huge vocabulary term for Carl Jung. What is the collective unconscious? This is the shared conscious experience you have with all of your ancestors. It's this idea when you die, you somehow pass on some form of memories or instincts onto the next generation, that there's a genetic idea. For instance, the reason you may find snakes or spiders a little bit creepy, they give me the Maybe, jeebies, maybe because you've had ancestors that have died from snake and or spider bites. So according to Carl Jung, because we have this almost caveman-esque shared collective unconscious, we're all basically the same. We have the same type of instincts. We have the same types of behaviors. Wow. And he really wanted to prove this. So what Carl Jung did is he went around, looked at every culture he could, and looked at their folklore, their tales, the religions wanted to find if there are any common themes because if you have two cultures that historically have never interacted with one another Carl Jung argued that if they have similarities that is evidence of this collective unconscious so was he successful well let's look at this Adam and Eve story in the Bible first humans what did Eve do she's a woman went into uh, the Garden of Eden found some forbidden fruit 
bit into the forbidden fruit and convince Adam to eat the apple. What was in the forbidden fruit? Knowledge. All of this bad stuff too that came out. Now there was evil everywhere. So here's this woman who introduced knowledge and all the evils into the world. Wow, that's a pretty horrific story. Who's, who's uh, Pandora? You ever hear the story of Pandora? Pandora had this box. She wasn't supposed to open the box, but she did. And what was in the box? The same damn stuff that was in the apple. They're the same freaking stories. Carl Jung, he called these common universal images found within all these stories throughout time and culture, archetypes. Archetypes. So these archetypes are these universal things that are evidence of our collective unconscious and they're everywhere. For instance, in most fairy tales, who's the hero? A young male warrior type. A fertile, young, strong man. Ha ha! Ha ha! Ha! So think of your grim fairy tales, your African folklore. I mean, I love this stuff. Look at this. So this is true in Arabian Nights. This is true in Irish fairy and folk tales. We find a whole bunch of archetypes in Aesop's fables, even though he used mostly animals. And of course, here's the fairy tales from around the world. Andrew Lang's collection. Man, there's a lot of archetypes in here. I love this stuff. This I can't get enough of fairy tales. It's how I learned how to read, and it's just short stories that are so fun with a little lesson dabbed in there. Here's Hans Christian Andersen, and of course we have Grimm's Complete Fairy Tales. I've got that one uh, right here. Here's Grimm's Complete Fairy Tales. Oh, and then let's even look at some horror as well. <laughs> oh my goodness. I can't even carry them, there's so many of these books. So when we look at these stories, most of them have these archetypes. Sure, there's variations. In fact, some people argue that today, those movies in Hollywood aren't new movies, they're just rehashing old stories. And nowadays, they don't even try to hide it. They're just re-releasing the same stories, even with the same name. I'll give you more examples of archetypes. Who traditionally is the wisest person? The wise old man. Who typically plays the villain in these stories? It's an old woman jealous about the fertility of a young woman. Think about it. You got Little Mermaid, Cinderella, Snow White, yada, yada, yada. Look at all these stories and you see these strong archetypes. Sexist? Definitely. So did Carl Jung succeed in finding archetypes everywhere? Yeah, he even found them in symbols. The mancala is this circle, universal sign for peace, harmony. But let's transform this mancala into other things. You ever see this symbol? Or how about this symbol? Or maybe this thing? There are these ideas of harmony, motherhood, nature, earth, the world. So for some reason, the circle is kind of this universal symbol throughout time and cultures. And this is why I love studying Carl Jung because you get to read a whole bunch of fairy tales. Let's spatter some other archetypes in there really quick because I want you to know this for test reasons. If you're my student or maybe someone else's student, they're probably gonna ask you about the anima and the animus, or as I like to call it, the anima and the animusk. Because the anima is Carl Jung's idea in every man is a woman. No matter how strong, male, masculine type you are, there's still this nurturing, beautiful, feminine female within you. And this is the anima. And you can remember that because the A at the end of anima traditionally means feminine. That's what it's done here. If the anima is the femininity within all men, what do you think animus is? The animus is the masculinity in all women. So again, Carl Jung, is arguing men, women, doesn't matter. When it gets down to our collective unconscious, we're all the same. Pretty nice to think about. He also used the term the shadow. The shadow knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? <laughs> the shadow. The shadow is basically Jung's equivalent of the id. It's this impulse we have to do harm, do wrong, and really indulge. And a lot of these theorists, you're gonna see it's a translation game. This theorist used this term, and this theorist is using this term. Apples, oranges, they're actually apple oranges. They're the same thing. Hey, we're into the third section of this video. Jung's assessment techniques. 
How did Jung handle his clients? Word association, this type of free association Freud used, but the word association. For instance, let's do it. Clear your mind. Relax. Breathe a little bit. I want you to tell me the first word that comes to your mind when I say father. Let's try another one. What's the first word that comes to your mind when I say jealousy? What's the first word that comes to your mind when I say money? That's Carl Jung's word association. He also what? used symptom analysis. If you came in and you were complaining about some issue, he would want you to talk about the symptoms. Tell me, how does it feel? You. Just keep on talking about your symptoms. Oh, I've got a cough, my nose is dripping, I'm kind of sleeping more than I should, my ass itches in the middle of the night. Whatever it is, he wants you to just keep on talking, 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 and talk specifically about the symptoms. The idea is you'll be so focused on the physical aspects of how it actually feels that you're gonna start maybe accidentally revealing your unconscious about what's going on. Dream analysis. He also did dream analysis, much like Sigmund Freud. Carl Jung's dream analysis, really interesting. He criticized Sigmund Freud's idea that dreams are just unconscious wishes. No, Carl Jung said that your dreams are a powerful weapon of preparation because you can have nightmares. Think of it this way, I love this. Mm, 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 so good. You have a test the next day and you need to study for this test. And so you're up all day, all night, studying for this test, and finally you go to sleep. Enter the dream world. You have a nightmare. In this dream, you show up to school, and you are taking the test in your dream. And not only are you not doing well, but you can't even read the test. When you're reading the test, the words are just all scrambled and running all over the place. Oh, oh man. It feels awful. And you look around and everyone's looking at you and they're laughing. Not just because you're doing bad at the test, but what are you wearing in this nightmare? Nothing. They're laughing at you and your naughty bits. So you wake up in a cold sweat. And now it actually is test day. You go to school and maybe you even struggle during the test, but it doesn't feel as bad. Why, if you're struggling during the test in real life, is it not so bad? because at least you're not naked. So in this way, Carl Jung believed that our dreams are a great way for preparing us, whether it be for uncomfortable social situations, physical challenges, etc. And there's actual research that backs this up because when you practice something in your dreams, it activates the same neurological regions of your brain that it would if you were awake. And therefore, you're actually making synaptic connections. It's basically practicing situations in your sleep. He nailed it. Brilliant, Carl Jung. Mwah. Mwah. All right, we should spend some time talking about the Myers-Briggs type indicator. You've probably heard about the Myers-Briggs. It's one of the most popular personality assessments out there. And there's so many different versions of it available for free on social media, you've probably seen it. What Disney princess are you? What are your letters? We should talk about it, but at the same time, it's not exactly empirically sound pretty much at all. Carl Jung did not come up with the Myers-Briggs type indicator. No, that was Myers and Briggs. It was a mom and daughter who previously had pretty much no training in it. And they thought, hey, this is pretty cool stuff. We like what Carl Jung's saying. Let's expand it and take his typology from eight and double it into 16. And maybe you've heard this before. Oh, my dad's an ISTP, but I'm totally an ENTJ. What the heck does that mean? You know what, if you really want us to cover Myers-Briggs, let me know in the comments and I'll make a whole separate video about the Myers-Briggs. But all you really need to know for my test and the purposes of Carl Jung is he didn't create the Myers-Briggs. He inspired the Myers-Briggs test and it's not empirically strong. And that's pretty much everything about Carl Jung. We talked about his past, being a loner weirdo boy who dreamed and played with a wooden doll. We talked about his sex life. We talked about Carl Jung's theory and how it's been adapted from Sigmund Freud. He got rid of the sexiness aspect of it, added in the collective unconscious and archetypes, examined all these different cultures. And finally, we talked about his assessment techniques, word association, his brilliant dream analysis, symptom analysis, etc. 
I hope you enjoy Carl Jung. Did I do a good job representing him? Is there anything I'm missing that you wanted to hear? Let me know in the comment section. I will do my best to respond to your comments. What do you think of Carl Jung? Do the whole subscription bell thingy. I don't know. I'm not really good at self-promoting. I'm Professor Gerding, and I love psychology. <laughs>